Hello everybody, in this video I will start integrating Cardinal Cruise in a sample web app. Part 1 of the video series is intended for Cardinal Cruise Standard and Cardinal Cruise Hybrid because the first parts are identical. In the later parts uh, of the video series, we will have to split the tutorials. I know many developers and companies code in PHP, .NET, Rails, etc. So I chose a lightweight Python framework called Flask for the tutorial. I chose Python because it's easy to understand syntax, making it simpler to transfer the syntax of Python to another language. The goal of the video is to understand the steps and processes of Cardinal Cruise, more so than to code. Additionally, I have a follow along for anyone interested in coding with me. All the code can be found on GitHub with links down in the description. Now we're going to open up our web app. So to do that, we're going to have to go to a Python prompt. Uh, I use Anaconda and we're going to CD into the directory. And then we're going to do Python app.py to start the application. And then we're going to get a URL. And let's go ahead and copy this. And we're going to copy that right into the browser. And that should start our web app. So this is the unedited website. Here we're going to have all of our credit card information that we're going to use in our integration. So we can hide that. And let's look under the hood. So this is the back end Python. We're going to have to go uh, step by step, which is mirrored in the Cardinal documentation. So this is the back end. And now let's go ahead and look at the JavaScript. So again, we're going to be following it step by step. And let's go ahead and look at the HTML. So here we have just a standard um, HTML document. If I make this a little bit bigger, we can see that we're importing Bootstrap. So we're not going to do any CSS. We're just going to make this um, as simple as possible. And then in our checkout HTML page, we're just going to extend the base page. So we're only going to be working with the checkout page, the backend Python page, and also the JavaScript. And if we go into the checkout page, we can see that, let's go ahead and do this. So we can see that this is targeting this, and this over here is this div, and over here is the start. Uh, you can see start, in it, in it. Um, the reason why I put this as an include is it's the form, so it it's kind of uh, kind of long. So I didn't want to have too many things in our HTML page. So that is the back end. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna go into our documentation. Let's just make this smaller, and I recommend everybody. Um, reading all this before we get started. I've done this before, so I'm going to uh, be skipping around, but also um, making sure to follow every single step. So we're going to hit the Get Started page. We're going to let that load a little bit. Um, we're going to make this smaller. So scrolling down, we see that step one is the JWT creation. So when I first started, I really didn't know what a JWT was, and we can see a sample if we go to jwt.io. So let's take a look at that. So a JWT, it is just base64 encoded, and it's a header, a payload, and a signature. So the header is obviously going to be red. Um, this payload is going to be purple. And the signature is going to be blue. So if we just copy this over here and go to um, base64decode.org, if we put that in there, and we run decode so we can see the sub name IAT and then uh, John Doe with a bunch of numbers. So sub name IAT John Doe with a bunch of numbers. So that's what a JWT is. And to create a JWT, I guess you can create it by hand, but here are some um, libraries and the different frameworks that you can use. So for example, um, with Python, they had this library called Py JWT, which I used. And then here's like the .NET equivalent. Um, here's like the Node.js equivalent. So all the different frameworks have the different libraries to create a JWT and also to validate one. 
So you're going to want to uh, pick one of these. And let's scroll back up. Okay, so um, we're gonna we're gonna create this. Let's go ahead and see how they want us to create this. So we're going to have to put in required claims or required fields. So this is the JTI, and this is just a unique identifier um, issued at is just going to be the epoch time um, issuer is going to be a identifier that's going to be given to you by Cardinal or unit ID is going to be um, also given to you by Cardinal, and then the payload is just going to be the um, order information. So if we scroll, and then these are also the optional claims, but if we scroll down, we can see the raw JWT sample, and um, this is this is how they filled it out, and we're going to be doing the same thing. So I guess the first thing that I'm going to do is import the library, import JWT, and I'm going to create my JWT right now. I'm going to pause the video. I went ahead and created the JWT, and now I'm going to walk through the code that I added. So one important distinction is I use pip install pi JWT instead of pip install JWT because there is a difference, and you want to install the pi JWT if you're following along or using Django or Flask. And next is the time library. I want to get the epoch time, so this library will help us get that. And then also we want a universally unique identifier for our JTI. So we imported this as well. And then here, the secrets. This is going to be something that you want to add. Um, I guess maybe put it in your base directory. Um, this is some, somewhere that it's hidden, because for me, it's right here, and this contains my API key. So in that file, the API key is the only um, thing I have in there, because the the issuer and the org unit ID, they're going to be passed to the front end. So your uh, consumer is going to be able to see that if they open up the console. Um, they're, they're probably not going to go looking through that, but... Um, just just be aware that the API key should be hidden. And the next thing is here, the random ID. So this is going to come from this function, UUID1, which is from this library. And we're going to have to put it into a string, because if we don't, it's just going to be a universal unique identifier object. And that's going to throw us an error if we try to create a JWT with it. And then the epoch time, I had to round because if I didn't, it would give me a lot of decimal points, which if we look here, there are none. So we want to keep it as um, accurate to the documentation as possible. And then the amount, this is going to be arbitrary and dependent on the uh, client's order. So I just put $100 here. And then the payload. So let's scroll back up to the description. So this is the JTI, and this should be a unique identifier, and it's going to change each time the JWT is generated. So I just did the um, universally unique identifier, and the issued at is just going to be the epoch time. The issuer is going to be the merchant, which these the issuer and the org ID should be provi provided to you by Cardinal, as well as the API key. And then the payload, which has the order details, and then the order number. I just, I just um, removed the first 10 um, characters in the universal unique identifier, and I just put order in there. And then with the amount, I guess this is a very important thing to highlight, is that there are no decimal points, so you do not want something like this. You want to remove that. Um, I just did it with, with this simple function. And then the currency code is going to be USD, so this is um, America's currency code. And then the objectified payload to true. So if we scroll down, here we can see that this is set to true because this is a um, object view of... Our JWT, where if, if we scroll down, this is set to false. Whoops. 
Uh, okay, uh, this is set to false, and this is a stringified version of the object. So I like mine um, to be laid out like this, so it's easier to read, and I want it to be true. Okay, now we're going to have to pass it to the front end. So I just did an... I'm not really creative with my naming convention, so I just put JWT underscore because I couldn't name it JWT since that is what the library is called. Um, anyway, we're going to encode it with the payload, which is going to come from here, and also we're going to sign it with the API key. So depending on the library that you chose right here, it's, it's going to be different how they lay this out. So maybe they want the API key first or the payload. Um, so that's going to be dependent. And then we're just going to put it in a context. We're going to, here, this is, I guess, Python specific, because when this encodes it, it encodes it as, as bits or as bytes. So we want to um, decode it so it can be a string. And um, that's what I did here. So it's kind of deceiving because this is encode and this is decode, but this just remember that it's from bytes to string. And finally, we're going to print it and see what it looks like. And then we're going to pass it to the front end. So I guess we're going to see what that prints out. And we're going to come here. We're going to grab that. I guess I already grabbed it. And this is what it looks like. It shouldn't have changed. We're just going to remove this. OK. Yeah, so you can see the JTI, this is uh, the universally unique identifier, the epoch time. And if you scroll over it, it'll tell you when it was created. And then the issuer, the org unit ID. And then this is our fields that we need. And then this is set to true. So. Looks like it's all formatted correctly. And the one more thing that I have to say about the JWT is the algorithm. So this is going to be a um, hash 256. So some of these libraries, they're going to have a check mark whether they have the um, hash 256. And you want to grab a library that does. It seems like most of them do. Yeah, so you just keep that in mind. And you want to. Um, hash it with uh, 256 encoding. So we're done with the JWT for now because if we scroll down, we're on step number two, which is include the script. So all we really have to do for this step is just copy this. Let's get rid of that. And we're going to go to our checkout and we're going to include the script like so. Cool. So that step was pretty easy. And here is a link of the CDN links. We can see that there's going to be a staging one and a prod one. So this is prod and this is staging. This is the one that we already grabbed. So while we're at this step, we might as well just grab the um, production one. And let's make this so we can do something like this. And so now we have the production one and the staging one. You can see this is um, says stage. So we're going to comment this out because obviously this is going to be testing and, and we're going to be in a staging environment. So we're going to save that. And now we can move on to step number three because we included songbird.js and now we can talk to it. So the first thing that we're going to tell it to is to configure logging level on. We're just going to copy and paste that. So there's many different things that we can say to Songbird. And after this loads, we can see a few of them. So this is timeout. It's how many milliseconds the init is going to wait before stopping. And then also how many retries it's going to go through before stopping. And then button and payment is going to be for the ACS window. We'll get into that a little bit later. And logging level um, on is what we included. And then Apple Pay, PayPal, and Visa Checkout, those are for the different like payment initiatives that merchants can use. And these are all the different descriptions. 
but we won't get into that right now. We're just going to use the basic flow. And so whoop, the next step is going to be listen for events. Ah, so this is going to be a preemptive um, move. We're not going to know what these things are yet. So I guess the biggest takeaway from this is just copy and paste and then we're going to see what they do a little bit later on in the flow. So the payment that setup complete is going to fire after the init call. And that's going to be on step number five. So we haven't gotten into that yet. And then the payment stop validated, that's going to be the start and continue. And that's going to catch any um, errors or failures in the flow. So even if there's a error in the init, start, or continue, it's going to be caught here, and we should handle for that. And then uh, the success and no action, those are going to be um, coming back a little bit later down the flow. So just, just be in mind that the error and failure catches um, any error in the different calls. So it's these, these two are kind of like the catch-all. And then these two are only reserved for uh, when the flow finishes. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and initialize Songbird. So the way that they have us um, do it is they want us to inc incorporate a, a JWT hidden field, with which is just in the HTML. So let's just copy this. And this is just a hidden input field. Let's save that. Whoops. And we're going to go, I guess we can put it anywhere. And the value, this is going to be context.jwt, which is going to come from the back end if we come here, context, and then jwt. So let's go back up here, and and this should not be here, so let's go ahead and remove it, let's save it. OK, so now we have our hidden field, our JWT container, and it's getting the JWT from the context. Now that we have the JWT in our HTML, we have to have the JavaScript grab it and put it inside of the init call. So, the JavaScript targets the JWT container ID, which, let's save that. We go right here, and it's the JWT container. So let's see what that looks like. Let's go to our checkout page. OK, so here we see that the base message in it, all expected payments have finished loading. OK, so we're looking good. Um, there's this one thing here that says, in it completed slowly, that's fine. Um, Cardinal uses that to log anytime there's something slower than expected. And if it was like an info, they wouldn't grab it, so they put it to a error. But um, you guys can just ignore that. And I guess we are finished with our part one. And next, we're going to split off into the different flows, so hybrid and standard. And if anybody has any questions about this process, please leave comments below so I can answer them. And then maybe other people who have the same question can um, see those too. Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you in part two.